right, so last week we discussed um, passages in the Bible that talk about slavery and conquest and the binding of Isaac. And today I want to talk about what the Old Testament, specifically the Old Testament, says about women um, in the law. And then also the whole subject of animal sacrifice. So many of the passages, many passages um, in the law that talk about women, when you just skim over them, they'll raise your eyebrows and here's some. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 22, uh, verses 23 to 24. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets, in this, meets her in the city and lies with her, then, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city, and the man, because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil in your, from your midst. Or De Deuteronomy 22, 20 to 29. If a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her, and they are found, then the man who lays with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver, and he shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. Or Deuteronomy chapter 1, or 21, verses 10 to 14. When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God gives them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured, and shall remain in your house, and lament her father and her mother a full month. After that, you may go into her and be your husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants, but you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. And then Exodus 22, verses 16 to 17. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If, he, if the father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. Um, so when you read these passages, you might think like, hey, um, there's some stuff like, I, I don't think that's right. And uh, we're going to talk about that. And so the first thing I wanted to do is establish the Bible's view of women um, only from the Old Testament at least initially, and then address these verses after. So I want to start with what does the Old Testament say about women? Let's start in Genesis, the beginning. In the, in the creation account, we read, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard this verse. Uh, it's pretty popular. What it's essentially saying is that both man and woman are image bearers of God. They're created in his image and thus are worthy of dignity and respect. Um, to us in the 21st century West, that's obvious. Or maybe if you're an atheist, just the dignity and respect part, men and women are equal. Um, uh, even if you haven't read the Bible, this would be something that you would say, yeah, I agree with that. That's obvious. But this wasn't the case for the rest of the world or um, even ma many places today. Um, so back in the time of the, of the Old Testament, when Genesis was being written, this idea would have been radical. Um, there are specific creation accounts where they say, only males are made in the are made from God. Only them, only they have the spark of divinity in them. And then even uh, Plato, he has this famous quote. I don't I don't know it verbatim, but it's essentially that um, if men don't live as good men or they live as cowards, then they will be reincarnated as women, and that women are lesser humans. And that was Plato, and that was after. Um, so pretty pretty derogatory statements towards women. But we find here in Genesis that it says. Um, God created male and female in his image. And so we could, uh, so the first thing to see is that men and women are both made in God's image and thus are equal as his creation. The next thing to realize, um, and the next, the next part that the Bible says about women is Genesis 2, 24. This is what it says. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So why is this significant? Why am I bringing this up in defense of what the Bible says about women? Well, one thing to notice, at least contextually within this passage, is that this is before Adam and Eve sinned. So they were living in communion with God in the Garden of Eden. Uh, things were ideal. With that said, this is God giving, an, giving um, a prescriptive teaching. This is the way things should be. It's essentially that God is endorsing monogamy as saying this is the way it should be. And this is really important because it was extremely common for a man to have many wives and concubines in the ancient Near East culture, which is where the Old Testament originates from, which always led to neglect. Monogamy is better for women now and for women then because it's most often males who have many partners. Uh, 
it, it'd be rare. It, it'd probably be, it probably, probably never happened um, more than a couple of times in the ancient Near East that a woman was the person with many partners and not the man. And like I said, when you're the, when you're part of the many, you get neglected and it's not good. Um, and then, so we see that God is endorsing monogamy. And that's a big thing, especially in this culture. And if that's a commentary about today, you see there's an increase in uh, polyamorous, polygamous relationships. It's not God's will. Um, that's just what I'm going to say. We can talk about that after if you want. And then this is, this is just a summary. God endorses monogamy, which pervert, preserves the dignity of women, and it results in them being cared for more because women are viewed, women were viewed as disposable and are viewed as disposable in a polygamous culture much more often than in a monogamous one. When there's a polygamous culture, bottom line, usually it's the male who has the many, the many partners. And when that happens, they, they view the people who are part of the many, which is usually the woman as disposable, which really isn't good. And it leads to a lot of mistreatment. So we see that men and women are equal in the eyes of God and created in his image and that God endorses a marital status, which will preserve the dignity of both. That's a pretty high view of women, and that's like incredibly high, especially for this ancient Near East culture that it came from. Um, so what about these passages? Uh, do we just ignore these passages because we see what the Bible already says? No, let's talk about them. And so this is the first one. This was Deuteronomy chapter 22, um, 23 to 24. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young man, because she didn't, the young woman, because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city and the man, because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. I want to note two things here. Firstly, this isn't rape. Um, the woman was not raped. And this is clear because of another passage and then the passage itself. There's another passage in the Old Testament law that says if a man rapes a woman, he's, he's to be put to death. And the woman is supposed to have no punishment, but the man who raped her is supposed to be put to death. Um, and then within this passage, uh, defense of why it's not rape, it secondly says that she is in the city. Um, essentially what's happening is someone seduced a betrothed virgin who was married and then went and had sex with her. Now here's the thing. She consented because, uh, like the passage makes it clear, they make it very hard for this to have been a rape. Basically, what they're saying is this woman, um, they basically have a law for the city and the country or like the rural areas. If a woman was is in the city and um, if she cries out, people live close enough that they will hear. Um, if she doesn't cry out, this didn't mean like she was being muffled or anything. It meant that she was like consenting to the sex, like she, she wanted it, um, she wanted it, he wanted it, something like that. Um, but if she did cry out, there's actually a law that talks about that, um, then he'll be punished. So it's not rape and it's basically adultery. That's what this law is about. And the reason I brought it up, if it's just adultery is because it's easy to see it as rape. Um, it's easy to see it as, oh, a man raped a woman and now they both die. How does that make any sense? That's not fair, um, but that, that's not actually what happened. And then the other thing that I wanted to address was this whole death penalty thing. Um, basically, the justification lies there in the passage. You shall purge the evil from your midst. Um, God is hard on sin, and we, we have mercy and grace through the blood of Jesus. Um, but he's not mocked. He wanted to preserve specifically his people Israel as a nation set apart. And when people did things like this, he had capital punishment. We can talk about that more later. The other, the next passage I want to talk about was Deuteronomy chapter 2, 22, 28 to 29. And this is what, and this one is, it seems even more troubling. It says, if a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her, and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all her days. So on a first reading, this would seem that a man can just rape a woman who isn't betrothed to someone and then pay a fine to marry her. That's what it seems like. Um, and I want to say, firstly, I don't blame anyone who would have that interpretation from a casual reading, especially us being 21st century Westerners. But with that said, it's just not the right. It's just not what it's saying. And here's why. I want to show you a parallel passage. This happens a lot in the law. They'll have... Uh, 
a law, a restatement of the law, and then a law said the same law said another way. And this is an example of that. This is Exodus 22. Um, it's saying the same law, but just in a different book. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If the father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. So essentially what happens is a man seduces a woman. Um, she's not betrothed and she's not a virgin. So it's different than the one. The one before was adultery. This one is she's not betrothed to anybody. And then he goes and essentially marries her unless the father refuses. So this whole thing about rape, it, it's not rape and it's not being, it's not a woman being forced to marry her rapist. Um, and also another thing to realize is the word seizes her in this passage. It does not give a connotation of, of rape. And that's because when you look at the, the word in Hebrew, there's kind of two words that will give this idea of seize her. There's a, there's a more violent one and then there's a softer one. And essentially this is the softer one and it can't mean rape because like other passages exclude it. So the first thing to realize is this passage is not talking about rape. Um, and then, so this, this idea of rape, it's gone. And then what about this whole, um, this whole marriage thing? Why are they gonna get married? I mean, that seems kind of weird. If it's not rape and he seduced her, they're just gonna get married after having sex one time. Um, and here's the issue. Essentially, the woman was not sworn to be anyone's wife. She's not betrothed like the passage says, but now she's not a virgin. If you notice, it says that she's a virgin. Now she's not a virgin. And the problem is that was something that was highly stigmatized in the culture of the day, the ancient Near East culture. Um, virginity was something that was prized. And if someone was not a virgin, they were considered unclean or dirty or something like that. And men wouldn't marry them. And because of that, um, it was hard for women who didn't have, like who weren't virgins and weren't betrothed to have financial stability. Um, this is basically saying, if someone is not a virgin and then um, and then they're not married, women in this time were basically limited by the culture uh, in ways that they could care for themselves. Essentially, marriage or marriage was the way that women were provided for or from their fathers. And so basically, this is a safeguard that someone that someone who goes and seduces a woman and takes her virginity, he's kind of just disqualified her from marriage. But in the same, at the same time, that disqualifies her from, um, from having financial stability. So this is actually for the woman. This is the idea that you decided to, you know, have sex with him. He seduced you, um, which way you want to look at it. But now no one's going to marry you. So this man should marry you because otherwise, if he doesn't, other people won't and you won't have financial stability. So that's, that's basically the main point about the whole marriage thing. Why would this person who seduced her have um, marry her? Because once your virginity is gone in this culture, people kind of look at you as used. People kind of look down on you and they don't want to marry you. And that isn't right. And the Bible isn't saying that's right either. It's just acknowledging that people thought this and it's trying to help the woman. Um, and then the, the other thing is, what about this whole 50 shekels of silver? What about this whole bride price thing? Is this trying to say that, you know, women have a price, uh, that women are only worth 50 shekels? Uh, the answer is no, that's, that's just not right. There was, this was just a standard practice in this culture and it kind of showed commitment firstly, um, that you know what, I'm giving this amount of wealth to your family to show that I'm committed and it fostered interaction. That's it, it's not putting a price on the woman, it's a, it's a, it's a cultural practice. And then the other thing to, to realize is that we live pretty comfortably, most of us. And so we, we don't look at people in terms of labor, but the thing is when you're living kind of in an agrarian society and you have to work and work and work, not only is your daughter now out of the house, but a worker is gone. Um, and so it's also kind of compensation for the lost labor. It's not saying that women are just labor, but it, it's, it's just realistic. I mean, I do landscaping and if I'm not there, like a lot more work falls on the rest of my coworkers. And it's the same, it's the same here. If someone leaves the household, there's more work for everyone else. So it's kind of a compensation. Okay, but what about this passage? This says, when you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord your God gives them into your hand and you take them captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman 
and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails. And she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured, and shall remain in your house, and lament for her father and mother a full month. After that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. Isn't this messed up? You just see a pretty enemy from someone you've conquered and then take them? Well, here's the answer. Uh, and this is, this is something that's very, very important to understanding these passages. Like I said earlier, marriage for women, it meant financial security in this culture. And so these women have either just been bereaved, their husbands are dead, or they were never married in the first place. So they're still going to want to get married. That's just a fact. And if, if, if it's not for um, um, romantic at the very most, which would be kind of hard to be romantic, at the very least, it's that they will have financial security. So we see that the marriage part is mutually beneficial. He wants to marry her. She wants to be stable, secure. What about the whole shave head and nails thing? Well, these people are prisoners of war and they're, they're dirty. Like that's the bottom line. You're, you're extremely dirty after being conquered. Um, and so you have, to, you have to shave their head probably for lice and pair their nails because there's a lot of bacteria that gets in the nails. Um, it's, it's a sanitary thing. And also one, one other thing is that it says that if you see a beautiful woman and you wanna take her to be your wife, when you strip her of her hair and basically of her nails, it's kind of saying like, do you wanna still marry her? Because did you just, did you just wanna marry her for lust or for something else? And if it was just for lust, it's going to be harder for you to lust over her after you've done all these changes to her physical appearance. And so that's one thing also you need to realize. Um, that's why it's in place so that people wouldn't just marry and then, and then dump them. And then the, the other thing to realize is that this treatment is actually very, very generous. Um, there's accounts that, that just describe what people did to cities that were plundered and it was basically like they would go in to the to the conquered peoples and they would do whatever they wanted um and it's sad they would they would rape the woman they would beat the woman they would kill the woman and this is a law saying you can't do that if you are going to marry them this is how it should be done so uh you might be thinking this a lot of these laws have gone from seeming to be bad for women to actually being kind of safeguards and this is the other thing that I talked about last week. A lot of the Old Testament law is, firstly, it's not God's ideal, but secondly, it's God trying to help, um, trying to work and help in the, in the most that um, will be allowed with this culture. Like I said with the whole slavery thing last week, the reason people had to be indentured servants is because of sin. And so when they had to be indentured servants, God decided I'm gonna set guidelines or else they're going to be mistreated. And in the same way, especially with this passage, this was something that was already going to happen. And God said, no, you're not going to treat them how other cultures treat them. They rape them, they beat them, they murder them. You're not going to do that. I have laws here so that you don't do that. And so these ended up turning into laws that are supposed to protect women. And so a lot of these misconceptions, there's a misconception about the culture. And because of that, we kind of have a misconception about the, what the Bible was teaching. It reminds me of something that Dr. Paul Copan wrote. His book has got more a monster. He explained basically that the Old Testament law regarding women was not the ideal, is not what he wanted, which is what you explained. But there was an incremental step in a fallen patriarchal society. So imagine that there are a bunch of people who eat sugar every day and they need to lose weight. You're not going to tell them, okay, no more sugar, period. They're not going to be able to stick to that. You know, it's impossible. They're not going to do that. It's going to do more harm than good. If you tell them, okay, one sweet thing a day, you know, now, obviously that's not the ideal. You want them to not eat sugar, but that's going to get them closer to the ideal. If you throw it all on them at once, they're not going to stick to it, but it's an incremental step. And that's exactly what was in the Old Testament. If you throw the perfect law on them in one go, they're not going to be able to stick to it. But we see that it was an incremental step to a fallen society. And so that's just it. It was case law. Let's imagine there's a law that says, okay, if someone steals a donkey, then do this. 
Now that doesn't mean stealing a donkey is okay. But saying when someone does steal a donkey, this is what you're gonna do. So fact is once again, that this wasn't the ideal, but this was just putting those safeguards in place, which is what Arthur explained. When we say that it was not the ideal, we're not saying that, you know, God is weak for that. It's actually his compassion, which makes him, which makes him give a law like this. It would be, it would not be compassionate for him to put a perfect law on them when he knows full well that that won't happen. Even with this um, not ideal law, they were unable to keep it, but that's because we're sinners and that's why Jesus came. And then the other thing is like I said, it would be worse otherwise. And so I was listening to just an economic, uh, economic person and they asked them, why, why didn't the, the constitution of the United States or no, yeah, I think it's constitution, automatically abolish slavery. And he said, you're being anachronistic with your interpretation of history. If they were to, um, if they were to want to abolish slavery in 1776 with the constitution, the union would have never started and there would have been a split. Basically what would happen is you would have the North without slavery and then the South with slavery as different countries. What does that lead to? Well, the North has no legal claim over the South, so they can perpetuate slavery as long as they want. But as it is, they left it kind of ambiguous, and then that gave room for um, the Civil War. Essentially, here's the point. When we work with fallen people, which we all are in this fallen world, we can't expect perfect. And that just makes the glory of heaven all the more. It's, it's not worth comparing what we have here.